Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Schwartz. I'm Vice President of North American Engineering here at Checkpoint. Uh, and we're excited to be a uh, co-sponsor of DevOps Summit Canada 2021. Um, <clears throat> this uh, this session is gonna be about threat modeling and supply chain. And um, I'm really excited to uh, spend some time uh, with you guys today to cover this. Um, and we'll dive right in. So, um, you know, Captain Obvious for a moment, we are uh, very much in a uh, brave new world where the diversity of access among uh, very, very different populations with uh, increasing diversity of devices and assets that they're accessing from is uh, really pushing organizations to modernize their application delivery and development processes on the back end to supply um, those, uh, th those applications. And, and we, we see this create um, pressure points in many organizations across the board, both on the end user consumption side of the application, as well as the application delivery side, which we'll talk about uh, in, in, in this a little bit more in this session. So when we talk about risks to the supply chain and, and um, you know, and, and the impact um, and how that relates to threat, vulnerability and consequences, um, <clears throat> what we see is that there's multiple elements that are of fundamental concern. One, um, obviously um, being able to provide uh, um, very broad exposure from um, uh, preventative controls of, of, of threats, as well as uh, identifying vulnerabilities or weaknesses that in, in, the, um, in the system and the development of these solutions, but also um, be able to provide protection against supply chain risks within that environment. So when we talk about all the different components that go into modern applications and the diversity of uh, both modifications and code infrastructure that these applications uh, live on, the challenges are, uh, are, are increasing at, at an accelerating pace. Um, that when, we, when we're delivering applications within uh, consolidated server infrastructure, um, we, can, uh, we, we had one place to go to operationally maintain and, and uh, uh, review security controls and, and characteristics. Now that we have maybe an application server with dozens of different um, diverse components, all uh, on different versions of different up, upgrade cycles, update cycles, modifications, and uh, very often with different owners within each of these subcomponents um, or you know, serverless functions or workload uh, elements, that the security uh, exposure and risks that are presented, not only from those assets themselves, but from the downstream components that those assets uh, maybe uh, may have either dependencies or maybe pulling information from or publishing information to creates a very, very wide surface area of exposure from a security perspective. And the, the security implications here are not theoretical. Um, that when we look at the, the, um, the real impact that exists and the real exposure that exists uh, at every stage of um, you know, a software life cycle and, and uh, CI CD uh, deployment cycles, um, that we see that these are they're very, very tangible risks um, with you know, uh, quote unquote legacy infrastructure uh, as demonstrated with uh, uh, the SolarWinds breach or what ultimately became Sunburst, uh, but even more recent uh, compromises like Code Cove that, um, uh, th that, that occurred much more recently, but uh, also on much more modern infrastructure. But we see that these exposures uh, exist in, um, you know, at every stage of um, the CICD uh, pipeline. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a more specific way. But when we, when we look at, um, you know, what is actually occurring as part of these attacks, we see that there's a lot of commonalities amongst uh, these, these security events and the exposures that are uh, foundational to these security events. That they leverage a lot of common uh, tactics and techniques which, uh, which are not surprising uh, that we've seen in, in, in traditional security circles for uh, a long period of time. Privilege escalation and persistence, uh, either compromising secrets or leveraging privileged accounts uh, that have unnecessarily uh, broad access. Um, and we'll talk about application owners and how they uh, develop applications with maybe wildcard access to get something working, and there's no uh, governance around scaling back the permissions necessary for, for runtime 
uh, enforcement or uh, limiting, um, uh, you know, uh, limiting privileged access. Um, but also, you know, uh, obfuscated C2 communications, command and control communications using uh, addresses that are or last mile that may be unknown to the organization. Uh, there may be anti um, forensics capabilities associated with identifying if certain runtime elements are uh, operating in a, in a sandboxed environment. Um, and then, you know, as we've seen in many cases, uh, user impersonation and, and um, you know, this, uh, SAML forgery is, is, uh, is, has been a key element of compromises in email and travel systems, SharePoint, uh, and other file sharing applications. Um, but what we're able to, you know, see in a very, very consistent way is that uh, these common attributes associated with attack um, are, are, are fundamental to us um, getting better at, uh, at, at, at solving these problems. Now, when we look at, um, you know, from a, a, a security um, operations perspective, how we can improve the outcomes here, that there's many, many different technologies associated with um, delivering better outcomes in this space. Um, there's zero trust infrastructure, there's data encryption, um, access controls, tamper evident um, and, and tamper resistant and, I, and identifiers associated with um, modification of cloud infrastructure. There's, uh, you know, in the physical world, uh, there's RFIDs and barcodes and, um, you know, we can provide asset management uh, around uh, different pieces of infrastructure to be able to provide some type of continuous monitoring around um, CMDB or, or database, uh, database assets. Um, but being able to provide these in a cohesive framework um, is, is a challenge because it's not just uh, the, the key stakeholders for success here are not just defined by um, the security operations teams, but the application owners themselves, uh, as, as well as um, the, uh, the, the stakeholders elsewhere in the organization need to be part of the process to provide better security. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how we're actually uh, delivering that. So when we look at, uh, you know, just as an example, MITRE framework is one model of um, of, of uh, you know, one framework that, that uh, organizations have been successful with. Um, and this is uh, directly from MITRE around, uh, you know, providing software bill of materials and evidence-based trust uh, between every element uh, and every um, connected asset within uh, the um, delivery of supply chain uh, functionality that being able to provide um, non-controvertible and, and uh, being able to identify assigning code and signing infrastructure that can verify both ends of the communication is one element of, of uh, or one um, framework with which organizations have been successful uh, to provide security um, from an end-to-end -end perspective. So as we move from stage to stage, from code um, development to commit, um, to the build, test, uh, package, and, and, and uh, consumption of the application, that we can provide uh, validation of, of, um, of each component within uh, the delivery of, of that security model. Now, when we look at, you know, just starting, what can we do um, as an industry to improve security outcomes as it relates um, to DevSecOps and um, what, what uh, we, you know, we, we call shift left in security or, or deliver security earlier in the development process uh, there's a couple elements of, of how we can get there. One, um, you know, com, the comms framework is, uh, is, has been uh, fairly well, um, uh, well understood and that um, DevSecOps is, is all about collaboration. It's about information sharing, experimenting with um, uh, cross-functional teams to be able to uh, identify where there's a fundamental need for change and experimentation and be able to automate uh, and iterate across those, those processes. So being able to provide, uh, um, you know, continuous delivery uh, in environments where there are um, frequent volumes of changes requires uh, automation and uh, very clear measurement of um, identifying what's working and what's not, where there are kind of out of bounds conditions, where there's access that's not necessary, where there's runtime controls or dependencies that, um, that can impact um, the exposure of, of the application. So, you know, if we, if we, again, you know, going one, one level uh, deeper in the onion of what this actually consists of uh, from a supply chain uh, risk mitigation plan. 
So there's, uh, you know, what we can, what we can um, distill down to three different layers, and we'll talk about each of these. Uh, but one, uh, in terms of uh, CI/CD pipeline, uh, there's secure development and uh, delivery end to end, and we talked a little bit about that in terms of uh, evidence-based trust uh, between assets, um, and and much of this aligns with and is consistent with uh, zero trust models that many organizations have adopted. That what is the smallest atomic element of security that we can create a, net, a security envelope around um, to ensure that infrastructure is not uh, being exposed and that there's not uh, downstream risks that are being introduced uh, by um, adjacent elements of the application delivery uh, cycle. Be able to provide dynamic and, uh, and, and, and static application testing um, to be able to identify exposures that are being ingested through uh, let's say uh, old libraries or um, vulnerabilities, CVEs that may exist in, in versions of code that uh, that were uh, stamped as gold image, but um, but we've come to learn uh, that there may be security exposures against, but also be able to provide runtime protections in a dynamic uh, um, uh, capacity to be able to provide uh, you know visibility into downstream components or dependency dependent components that are introducing exposure. Uh, like privileged access, like um, um, access to uh, protected resources, or um, being able to, um, as in, um, in in many attacks we'll talk about in in just a few moments, um, you know, building a dependent piece of code that is uh, that that is then being able to be updated uh, with malicious content or uh, malicious behavior uh, downstream after the fact after it's submitted for uh, deployment. Um, protect all secrets and uh, you know sign you know code signing capabilities, um, and and obviously this is uh, very very uh, central to um, um, the basis of of security of the entire ecosystem. But be able to recognize that um, that this is what we can do from a proactive perspective. When we look at what are the attributes of multi-layered attacks, um, that uh, they consist of elements that we've seen time and time again: lateral movement. Um, that once an infection uh, or a malicious agent or element is entered into the uh, either the application development process, especially in the case of, uh, of supply chain, but also in, in the case of, of general CI CD pipeline security, um, that lateral movement is trivial, privilege escalation, uh, and, and this is something that in many organizations is, is wildly under uh, monitored, um, be able to look for anti-evasion capabilities um, integrating with uh, identity management, uh, identity entitlement management infrastructure, um, and uh, AD, AD, which is uh, in many organizations the uh, uh, you know occasionally the worst enemy to security is um, is uh, the the um, is the uh, legacy of the AD environments that um, that exists that um, the overall hygiene of the environment that has not been updated. Uh, frequently enough or maintained properly that creates exposures for surfacing accounts that have not been deprecated uh, or permissions that have not been uh, uh, been removed. And in each of these cases, there's, um, there's, there's action that will improve the capabilities from a security perspective or reduce the overall risk of, of, of supply chain exposure. And this aligns with uh, processes monitoring and, and enforcement of processes and separation of duties code signing, identity uh, capabilities, UEBA, uh, advanced endpoint protections, as well as providing end-to-end -end visibility. Now, I, I wanna talk, I'll, you know, being a checkpoint's been in the industry for uh, over 25 years, I think it's important uh, to, you know, highlight some of the things that we've been doing, not just as a vendor in, in the industry, but also as a developer of, uh, of applications and software of what we're, what we're doing and what, and what the outcomes um, that we've seen from uh, our, our secure coding and uh, secure um, um, secure solutions and secure uh, security development related to CI/CD. So first off, um, our, our ethos centers around preventative controls and not detection, um, and th this is for two reasons. One, um, you know, pursuant to the threat landscape, that once malware enters the organization, the lateral movement uh, within that organization becomes uh, a bit trivial. Um, so that's a byproduct of, of uh, the environment we're operating in. But secondly, that when we talk about um, moving quickly and application developers that want to operate at increased velocity, um, 
that that anything that relies on detection uh, presumes a, a human being or some manual vehicle needs to approve or move from a te detection based element to a preventative based element. And if we uh, acknowledge the hard trends associated of scale that we and, and agility that we highlighted earlier in the uh, in the um, in the in the comms philosophy uh, is that that to provide adequate security at scale, it fundamentally requires automation, and that automation needs to be preventative um, to be able to uh, properly mitigate one the volume of threats relative to the changes that are being made within the environment, but also to be able to provide um, uh, real time capabilities in the case of evolution of those threats. That when the, the threat landscape changes, when um, the the surface area of exposure changes, or the threats themselves and the malicious behavior changes, that there needs to be an automated vehicle to be able to move with those changes in the threat landscape in the administrative changes within the applications. So let's let's look at Checkpoint as, as how we've been doing it. Um, so there's we focused uh, fundamentally on innovation and quality and that innovation and quality centers around uh, being able to provide qualitative advantage around preventative controls but also do so with a level of maturity and stability um, that enterprise organizations can trust, putting in line in their environments, which is um, um, by a wide predominance how we've been deployed in many organizations. Um, and then we have 25 years of, of, of innovating in such capacity. Um, and there's a very, very high dependency of uh, uh, an, an integration associated with ownership of each of the uh, technology groups but also uh, obviously a very fundamental need for uh, tight integration between those groups as um, the innovation leverages common infrastructure across uh, different elements of, of the code base. But when we look at the people, um, all new employees are required to go through uh, security incident handling, uh, secure coding course and security alert process that, um, that there's um, almost anyone in the organization can uh, introduce a no-go for major functionality or security exposures. Um, there's multiple levels of reviews uh, from a unit and system testing perspective, um, and this is done by multiple uh, individuals in an ongoing way. Um, uh, you know, under the assumption that um, that there needs to be independence in the assessment of security relative to the actual application delivery, and our, we recognize that our our code is our most protected asset. That um, if we can't trust the code and the applications we're delivering to our customers, um, then then everything else that's that's built on top of that becomes subject for compromise. So we we view security of our code as uh, as as among the single largest uh, fundamental fundamentally important uh, outcomes um, from a, a security perspective. So we have uh, security champions within each technology area, uh, and that central security ch uh, champion will work with our research teams to actually uh, um, test and uh, manage the alert process. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, this could be triggered by many, many pieces of the organization or individuals, uh, and it could be based on an internal finding, uh, based on an external finding uh, that, that uh, someone presents to us uh, publicly or, or through our, our uh, support organization, or it could be a downstream external uh, issue that based on, uh, you know, certain either uh, uh, libraries or open source elements that might be leveraged that we identify as relevant. And, you know, important to note is that when we use an, uh, an external open source, that we don't use it uh, blindly or as is. Uh, we, we un, un, uh, uh, again, identify what is the smallest atomic element of what we need to achieve with this uh, functionality and we strip out everything else. So it's uh, down to its most fundamental base. So when there is uh, a, a, a potential vulnerability or CVE identified with some of these downstream elements uh, or external uh, elements that we are not necessarily subject to it because we remove everything that we're, uh, that is unnecessary for our use of that uh, function. And then we obviously prioritize and, and uh, take the uh, necessary steps. Now, when we, when, when we look at application developers, our application developers probably aren't much different than your application developers. Uh, they have are, are velocity first minded. They want to move quickly, um, but they also, uh, there needs to be clear monitoring and controls 
uh, around what is the access and, uh, and functionality that they're uh, building into a piece of code. And is it accessing elements of, of the software that is unnecessary for their function? Uh, or is there, you know, is there a way to control the elements of, um, of what the application is being built to do to be able to manage the potential risk associated with that exposure? And that translates directly to how we leverage open source as well. I mentioned a moment ago about being able to control and reduce the surface area of exposure associated with that external access. But when we look at um, you know, the more modern projects that we've been working on, um, that there is a fundamental need to move more quickly. Um, so moving more quickly is sometimes uh, in direct collision with providing better security. So uh, this is where being able to provide uh, continuous enforcement and, uh, and, and, and automation uh, around these controls and, and the software functions and the development lifecycle is, is really, really critical. Now, when we look at what are the outcomes, um, you know, when we look at the uh, vulnerabilities in our code that have been uh, publicly identified, and this is all uh, information uh, freely available from our public site, um, that over the last five years, uh, we've had 26 vulnerabilities in our software. Um, the, uh, we average five a year, and it, on average, it takes us six days per vulnerability to address. Um, and again, the, all of this is publicly available from these other vendors' sites as well. When we look at the software vulnerabilities and exposures and the time to resolution or a time to um, uh, addressing or and closing those exposures uh, for our nearest competitors in the space, uh, there's a vastly different approach. And again, this is all from each of these vendors' sites. This is not uh, kind of a, a checkpoint version of, of, of reality. This is um, uh, a differentiated outcome uh, through our focus on qualitative advantage in secure development. So now if we look uh, apply this to um, uh, DevOps and DevSecOps uh, in, in particular a, a bit more, when we look at um, the uh, what goes into the um, uh, software supply chain lifecycle uh, and, and how, how that relates to uh, CI CD delivery, that there's vulnerabilities or potential vulnerabilities and uh, uh, security implications at every stage of the process. So the developer could bypass co code review. Um, there could be a, a compromised source control system uh, that, is, uh, that is ingesting that, um, um, that, that application delivery application uh, delivered code. Uh, there's the possibility for the code to be modified after source control in between uh, the build process. Um, there's, there's the potential for co a compromise within the build server itself. Um, there's, uh, you know, the, the dependencies that are integrated into the build from the build server could also inject uh, security exposures. Um, we can uh, bypass CI CD um, and go right to uh, package development. And that package can also uh, come with dependencies that are external to the system. Um, and the, the, the package repo that's distributed to consumers could be, uh, could be compromised or the actual package itself could be bad. And you know, I highlight these not as uh, theoretical uh, conditions. These are all things that have happened. Um, and these are all um, security exposures that are all very, very subject to the supply chain lifecycle. When we look at solar winds, when we look at Code Cove uh, um, events, that these are all um, very concrete examples of what can happen when uh, security is not fundamentally integrated into the development process. Now, um, if we look at how we can do better, um, you know, this is uh, you know, a depiction of that same CI CD process, perhaps using the the logos and products and images that um, uh, many of you may be familiar with, but this is an application into the uh, image repository and then, uh, um, you know, uh, the image build solutions out to the deployment um, infrastructure. And when we, we look at that, this is where better security could be integrated, that uh, can we provide unit testing and dynamic and, and static application testing? Um, can we provide image scanning? and uh, runtime controls against um, either injected fields uh, or, or end user um, um, provided information. And how is that applied and enforced at runtime? Um, and that's, that's actually what, we're, what we've built, that 
Um, we can provide scanning of code analysis uh, and governance around that, um, uh, the, the, those scans at build time. So um, looking at infrastructure as code, so CFTs, um, um, uh, uh, cloud from um, whether using Terraform or some other um, image uh, or container repo that we can be able to provide scan against those repositories. We can provide um, uh, identifying vulnerabilities or known CVEs, embedded credentials, uh, and, and whether there's malicious code that's been injected into the build process. But at the same time, map uh, runtime security controls against uh, OWASP or um, um, runtime enforcement against uh, behavior and um, identify if there's access to unnecessary resources, unnecessary permissions, uh, whether downstream dependencies or in, um, in, um, elements that are injected into the application, that if the application is meant to provide a certain behavior and it's being asked to conduct behavior that's outside of that profile, uh, we could provide real-time enforcement at runtime. Um, and be, you know, this is, um, you know, again, if we map to that uh, code, commit, build, deploy model, um, this is how we can map some of that functionality across each of the um, CNAP, you know, Gartner's CNAP or uh, the, the four C's model, um, how we can map that against uh, each of these infrastructures. So from a, uh, a security posture management perspective, providing scanning during um, um, code and commit uh, integration. And then during deployment, uh, be able to look at uh, metadata associated with cloud assets to identify uh, behavior analytics, uh, posture visibility for runtime capabilities and um, at network access in terms of how these assets are situated in the environment, but also be able to provide that you know, similar functionality downstream for workload protection as it relates to uh, serverless functions, um, containers, workload assets. Um, and, um, you know, again, I won't go through each of these features uh, discreetly, but, um, but and be able to provide the integration for all of these capabilities into uh, the automation tool sets that your DevOps teams may be using today, um, or um, if you have a DevSecOps teams that, that they can leverage with existing infrastructure. And if we kind of zoom out and look at this um, in a slightly different model, apologies for the, uh, what, you know, what looks like a very uh, complex architecture, but how this layered security model might look. And if we move from, uh, in this case, right to left, which I know is the opposite, but um, if we go from right to left, that that code security and code scanning and image assurance that I talked about a moment ago, being able to apply that at a code perspective, the, some of the runtime controls and capabilities that are associated with uh, container-based security elements um, like uh, runtime assurance, uh, admission control um, for containers, uh, VM protection. Um, and then as we move further left, um, micro segmentation and east-west security controls, API enforcement, and then ultimately logical network security controls in, into and out of the cloud infrastructure uh, on a dynamic uh, basis. So when we look at where where we're going as um, as uh, you know as an enterprise, as a uh, application delivery um, uh, organization ourselves, that we're looking at every all, you know all the so all the potential entry points of security and where the surface area of exist exists uh, relative to social engineering, supply chain capabilities, um, externally published vulnerabilities, internally identified vulnerabilities as well as configuration management and being able to identify how those entry points may translate to uh, malicious um, um, uh, um, actors gaining a foothold in the environment and gaining persistency. But um, some, of the, uh, some of the technologies that we've talked about and I highlighted very briefly center around zero trust, AI-based preventative controls, uh, uh, preventing uh, C2 communication and be able to provide real-time autonomous uh, um, and um, and um, continuous uh, posture management, be able to provide uh, serverless functions, and as well as code security for um, for application owners and, and introduction into uh, CI CD uh, pipelines, but also be able to map that against uh, the threat intelligence uh, with it, uh, with the broader environment as it relates to endpoint IoT, traditional network controls, email security. Um, and be able to provide the threat intelligence of what's happening in the wild um, down to what's relevant for this particular application and be able to, be able to provide real-time enforcement against capabilities 
um, in an autonomous way uh, that will prevent the, the things that we know have led to bad outcomes, uh, um, like uh, lateral movement. So, um, you know, in, in, in summation, uh, we've adopted security as a culture, uh, and it's mo very, very fundamental. Uh, and that, that leads to us to be able to build more secure source code um, and, and integrate that into the build and delivery platforms. And what we found from a customer facing perspective is that better security creates better outcomes. Uh, and this is not a checkbox type of conversation with your application owners, um, but that we can provide um, um, automated, uh, real-time, uh, preventative uh, security controls that will um, will we'll, we'll still integrate uh, from a, a functional perspective with uh, many modern applications and uh, DevOps models. So um, thank you for, uh, for joining our session today. We very much appreciate uh, the audience and, um, and uh, participation in the uh, DevOps uh, Summit Canada.